Good to see everyone back this afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us. We are going to cover uh, one of our question and answer sessions tonight is what we're going to do. And we only have one question that we're going to cover, uh, but I think it, it requires uh, that much attention. I was sent a link by a friend a couple of days ago to an article on a website called BeliefNet, and it is a, a blog site for different bloggers. I believe most of them are denominational, if not all of them are, uh, but there's some food for thought on there and some very uh, interesting articles that uh, show up from time to time. This link was to an article with the title, Jesus Did Not Die on the Cross for Our Sins. Does that strike you? Does that get your attention? I think maybe that was the purpose of the title being, being such. Jesus did not die on the cross for our sins. What the article was about was the concept that we might call penal substitutionary atonement. It was about atonement, theories of atonement, and how Jesus atoned for our sins. It was written by uh, a woman named Megan Bailey. And while there were some good things in the article, there usually is, um, certainly we don't agree necessarily with her conclusions, uh, but we want to deal with that issue. Did Jesus die on the cross for our sins? Did he pay the price? Did he satisfy the wrath of God? That's the problem, I believe, that those who hold this view have with the idea of Atonement as we teach it, as we find in Scripture, the idea of penal substitutionary atonement is the idea that in Jesus' death, he satisfied the wrath of God. Now, we'll have some more to say about that, but as opposed to that concept, that idea, what is becoming more and more popular, this theory's been around for a long time, just as most of these concepts are. Uh, they've been around for a long time, and they'll fall out of favor, and then they'll come back in. Uh, but what they espouse is the idea now that uh, Jesus' death, his sacrifice on the cross, was simply a demonstration of his love. It had nothing to do with God's wrath. It had nothing to do with uh, paying a price or paying a penalty. But what I want us to see in answering this question, did Jesus pay the price for our sins, is that it's a kind of a mix of all of these things. The Bible uses these, these ideas about atonement not to the exclusion of, of one concept and simply focusing on one illustration or explanation of Jesus' sacrifice, but there are different references, different scriptures that, that use different terminology about Jesus' atonement for our sins. Let's first of all talk about what they, most of the religious world, some in the religious world, you have to have studied these things to even know that this is a concept. But I want to share with you three theories of atonement that, are be, that have been set forth by religious scholars. And like I said, I think there's some things in each one that the Bible says. I think that there's, it can be all three at once is the idea. It doesn't just have to be one to the exclusion of the others. But there are three major theories regarding our atonement through the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, one is called the ransom theory. Uh, it's also known as Christus Victor, the ransom theory that Jesus paid the ransom to redeem humanity from Satan, that Jesus' death was a payment made to Satan. Now that's not necessarily uh, the concept that we find in Scripture, that a payment was made to Satan, that our freedom and our liberty was bought from Satan. We don't see that necessarily explicitly stated, but we do find the idea that Jesus was our ransom. The second theory of atonement is known as the satisfaction theory. And in this theory, it's the idea that Jesus, through his obedience to God, fulfilled the debt of obedience. That because Jesus was completely and perfectly obedient to the law and to God, then there is no longer need for us to be obedient to the law. And again, while there are aspects of this theory, the law has been taken away. We're no longer under that law. Jesus did fulfill that law. We still must be obedient 
to God as well. And a subcategory of that um, theory of atonement is this penal substitutionary atonement idea that Jesus paid a debt that we owed, that we could not, that his sacrifice in, in some places in Scripture is referred to as a legal transaction. There was a debt, it needed to be paid, and Jesus paid it. And in so doing, Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. That's part of this concept. And, and, and some will even say, use the terminology that God punished Jesus for us on our behalf. He imposed on him the punishment that we deserve. And we'll explore some of those concepts as we go through these scriptures. The third theory that's set forth is the subjective or the moral theory of atonement. And that is that by Jesus' sacrifice, our perception of God changes. From being a God who is offended, who is hurt, who is harsh, and who is punitive, to a God who loves, who is willing to sacrifice, who is kind and forgiving. This is the theory that really has a problem with the concept of punishing Christ for our sins, of Christ paying the debt to satisfy the wrath of God. Those two sometimes are opposed to each other uh, in these religious circles. But, again, I think there are some, some things in each one that may be true. And when we look at these scriptures, I hope that we'll see that our atonement through the blood of Jesus Christ is not just a matter of one thing to the exclusion of all others. And then when it comes to these religious questions, when it comes to biblical questions, that's where we start to get into trouble. When we say it's, it's this way and it can't be any other way. We must take all of scripture. We must let every verse harmonize with itself. There's no contradictions. There are no errors in scripture, but we may get in one place an illustration that uses one kind of language, one kind of terminology, and another that uses something different. It doesn't mean that one is true and the other is false. It means that we have to consider how it's like both of those at the same time. And so that's what we want to do this afternoon in answering this question. Did Jesus pay the price for our sins? Did Jesus die on the cross for our sins? We say that yes, he did. And in fact, Jesus himself used that word, ransom, that he was indeed the ransom for our sins. But let's first of all look in the book of Psalms. We read this, this verse this morning as we were thinking about covetousness and greed. In Psalm 46, 48, verses 6 through 9. It should say Psalm 49, verses 6 through 9. Psalm 49, I had that wrong on there. Psalm 49, verse 6, They that trust in their wealth and boast in themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious. The King James says it ceaseth forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. Here's the introduction of this idea of a ransom. When we die, we're dead. When we die, there's no further chance at redemption. Redemption occurs in this life. No man is wealthy enough in this passage to pay a price to God to redeem his friend or loved one who has gone on. There is no money that can be given. It doesn't work that way. That transaction isn't completed with physical wealth. It would require something else. But there is a concept here introduced that a ransom needs to be repaid Paid. In order for us to be redeemed, a ransom must be paid. Let's go next to Hosea chapter 13. Hosea comes right after Daniel. Hosea was the prophet to whom God instructed that he go and marry a wife from among the, the prostitutes. And it was the idea, the illustration there that Israel had been spiritually adulterous against God and God still loved them and wanted to bring them back and wanted to buy them back and Hosea went and bought back his own wife when she went back into her prostitution. Hosea chapter 13 uh, verse 14 says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues, the King James says. O grave, I will be thy destruction. That should sound familiar to you. 
Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. This is the verse that Paul is quoting in Oh, did I? Yeah. This is the verse that Paul is quoting in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the great resurrection chapter when he says, "O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory?" 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55. Here is the idea that God is going to ransom us from the power of the grave. It is a fear that we all have, death. We don't know what it's going to be like. We don't know what it's going to feel like. We don't know what existence will be like on the other side. But we will all die if we live long enough. That is, if we live to die before the Lord comes back, all of us will taste of death. It is appointed unto man once to die, Hebrews 9, verse 27. But God's intention has been to ransom us from the power of the grave. That's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to provide for all mankind. And he has done so in the person of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. The parallel passage would be Mark chapter 10, verse 45. But Matthew 20, verse 28, he says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, unto but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. God wants to ransom us from the power of the grave because of sin. And all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Then there is a ransom. We're being held at ransom by our own sins. And that is a price that none of us could pay. But Jesus said that he came to give his life a ransom for many. So this is certainly a biblical concept. It is certainly something that we see in scripture. And it is confirmed again in 1 Timothy 2 uh, verse 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So the ransom theory of atonement has some truthfulness to it. Jesus Christ truly is our ransom. Now, I don't know, I don't see any passages that say that that ransom, that price was paid to Satan, that he received anything out of that transaction. In fact, I think what we see is at Jesus' resurrection, that power of the grave was defeated. Satan was defeated. His head was once and fully crushed by Jesus Christ. And now all of us have a hope of life beyond the grave because Jesus paid that ransom. So there is some truthfulness, we say, even to that ransom theory of atonement, although we don't find any mention of the price being paid to Satan himself. The satisfaction theory, uh, penal substitutionary atonement specifically, there is... Scripture for us to believe that God was satisfied, that he was pleased with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I want us first of all to notice Matthew 17 verse 5. At the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus and Peter and James and John went up on the mountain and there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah. Jesus was speaking to them, Luke records for us, of his demise. What, what was going to happen, some of the details what it would be, be like to go through those things. That's what Moses and Elijah were there speaking with the Lord about. But it says, of course, after, after they have spoken with Jesus and then the voice from heaven comes that, that Jesus' closest friends hear, it says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I want us to get that idea. Of course, here he adds that phrase, hear ye him, because at his baptism... The voice from heaven came and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But at that time, it didn't, he didn't add, Hear ye him. Here, on this occasion, the Lord God adds, Hear ye him, meaning this is the one who has authority, even above and beyond the authority of Moses and Elijah. But we want to focus here on the, on the phrase, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Everything that Jesus did pleased the Father. He did satisfy God in his life, in his death, in his sacrifice, in his teachings. He did those things which please the Father. That was his intention, and that's exactly what he did. Jesus did satisfy God, and we need to understand that as we move forward here. Now I want us to notice Isaiah 53, the great suffering servant chapter. Verse 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, 
yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. If that passage doesn't teach penal substitutionary atonement, I don't know what it's teaching. What Isaiah is prophesying is that Jesus was going to be punished. He was going to be afflicted. He was going to be wounded and bruised. He was going to be striped. He was going to be crucified. He was going to be scourged. For us on our behalf so that we didn't have to suffer those things that word chastisement especially in verse 5 it's the idea of discipline or correction or rebuke it is punishment now Jesus never did anything wrong there was no deceit there was no guile found in his mouth he was sinlessly perfect and he willingly suffered these things so that we don't have to he suffered on our behalf. Now, whether it was God punishing him or whether it was God's wrath being appeased, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. There is still a wrath of God that will still yet be revealed at the judgment. The wrath of God will be revealed against all unrighteousness. The wrath of God is being stored up, according to Romans chapter 1, for that day. The wrath of God has not yet been fully satisfied. And it won't be until the day of judgment. But Jesus did satisfy a debt that we could not pay. He did satisfy God the Father. He did suffer on our behalf. He was punished so that we don't have to be. Matthew chapter 18 here. There is a parable here that if it doesn't teach that the Lord God the Father is satisfied can forgive then I, I don't know what the other what the purpose of this parable would be Matthew chapter 18 this is the parable of the unforgiving servant but let's think about the Lord in this parable therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king which would take account of his servants and when he had begun to reckon one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents we have discussed in our Wednesday night class how much money this was. This was more than a hundred lifetimes worth of earning. This servant could never pay this amount back. It was beyond his power or ability. He could live his entire life and give everything he earned to his king and never pay back this amount. And that's the debt that we owe to God. God is the king and we're the ones who have been forgiven of this debt. Yes, this is teaching us to be forgiving because our God is forgiving. He has canceled that debt, the debt that we owe because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This parable teaches us that our Father has been satisfied. That debt has been paid. He satisfied that debt. Owed unto him 10,000 talents, but for as much as he had not to pay... His Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant fell down therefore and worshipped him saying, Lord have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And that's all he had to do. That's all he did. He didn't earn his forgiveness. But he threw himself at the mercy of the king, of the judge, of his Lord. Then, verse 27, the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave the debt. I preached on this a while back, a few weeks back, maybe a couple of months ago, about how when, when we're forgiven, that debt is gone. We as Christians are not in debt to God anymore. We still think of it that way sometimes. <clears throat> but when we've been set at liberty, when we have been freed from that bondage, the debt has been canceled. It has been paid. We are no longer in debt. Jesus satisfied the debt. That's what forgiveness is. He forgets about that debt. It is an amount that we could never pay. What our, pro what our sins cost us before God. But Jesus paid that price for us in his sacrifice. Now the rest of the parable here is about us being forgiving as well. 
that servant who had been forgiven went out and would not forgive one of his fellow servants. And he then was turned over to the taskmasters, to the tormentors for not being forgiving. But the point there is that we have a father whose debt we owe has been canceled. It has been satisfied by Jesus Christ. One final verse as it, as it pertains to Jesus' satisfaction of the debt is from Ephesians 4, <clears throat> verse 32. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And I think that phrase is especially significant here, and I know the English Standard Version says, for God in Christ hath forgiven you. But I, I, I still think that for Christ's sake gets the picture across best here. Even if you think of it as in Christ, it means that uh, on his behalf, in the person of Christ, in the sacrifice of Christ, God hath forgiven you. God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. He looked on him and forgave us is the concept here. For Christ's sake, because of his sacrifice, his willingness, his love, he satisfied, he canceled the debt that we owe. Jesus certainly did pay our debt. Whether he satisfied the wrath of God, I believe there's still a wrath to come. Wrath is being stored up by those who are unrighteous and ungodly for the day of judgment. But we don't have to face that wrath because our debt has been canceled. We have accepted that forgiveness in our obedience to the gospel, and now we no longer owe the debt for our sins. What a joy, what a privilege, what an honor it is to be considered the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So there's some truth to that ransom theory of atonement. Jesus certainly is the ransom for our sins. There is certainly some truth to the satisfaction theory. Jesus satisfied the debt that we could not pay. And maybe there's some truth, there's a lot of truth to the subjective or the moral theory of atonement that Jesus' sacrifice was a demonstration, the perfect demonstration, the greatest demonstration of God's love that could ever be. And we have to turn to John's writings mostly for these references. And I just picked a couple. There are so many others here in chapter 10, chapters 13, 14, and 15 that, that demonstrate this concept. Chapter 10, verse 17, Jesus says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. He loves me, and he says, the Father loves you, because you have loved me. Because you've been my disciples, now the Father loves you, just as he loves me. And, and Jesus, John records Jesus saying that all through here. But we also want to notice John 15, verse 13. We know this verse, it's familiar to us. But again, this is Jesus who's saying this knowing what he's about to suffer, knowing what he's going through, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. There is no greater illustration of love than the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who left his eternal glory in heaven to be made of a woman, to become a child, to, to have flesh and bone, to, temp, to be tempted in all points like as we. There is no greater demonstration of love than for he who was sinless to lay down his life willingly for those whom he calls his friends. This is the sacrifice that he made, and it is indeed the perfect manifestation of God's love. 1 John 3, verse 1. Again, John, in confirming for us that we can know, that we know that we have been forgiven, that we have that relationship with God. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Behold, look, consider, think about the evidence for the manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. John chapter 1, his gospel account, John chapter 1, John says that he has given us the power to become the sons of God. And here in verse John 3, verse 1, he says that it is the greatest expression of love that he has allowed us the privilege to be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Certainly, Jesus' sacrifice is the greatest demonstration of love 
that will ever be seen on this earth. And Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. There is still a wrath to come. God is still going to execute His judgment against those who refuse and reject the sacrifice of His only begotten Son. Jesus demonstrated His love for the whole world. John 3, 16. 1 John 2, verse 2, He's the propitiation. He is the payment, the debt satisfaction for our sins, but not just our sins. He is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world if they will have it. Jesus has atoned for our sins. Have you come to Him? Have you asked for that forgiveness? Have you received the cancellation of that debt? It is the greatest gift that mankind has ever been given. And whether you want to specify that you believe in the ransom theory or the satisfaction theory or the moral or subjective theory, let's don't get caught up in that. Let's look at what the Scripture says overall about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He paid a debt that we could never pay. He satisfied God and His uh, and the payment that we owe Him, the debt that we owe Him, and He demonstrated God's love for us in the perfect manner. If you love Him, if you want to become a child of God, if you want to accept that privilege, then there are certain things you must do. You must be obedient to Him. Believing in Jesus Christ is absolutely essential. It's necessary. But that's not the final step in obedience. Believing in Him, making confession with our mouth is necessary. Repenting of our sins has been commanded by Jesus Christ. But we must be immersed in water. That immersion in water, that baptism, represents our new birth. It is when that old man of sin is put to death and we come up from those waters a new creature. We're washed, we're cleansed, we're forgiven. The debt is canceled. And you have that opportunity, if you've never done it, to be baptized this afternoon, right now. And if you've done that and you recognize Jesus' blood is no longer cleansing you of your sins because you're not walking in the light. You're walking in darkness. You have sin that's separating you from God. It needs to be repented of. It needs to be confessed. But we would love to assist you in any way that we can. If you have need, won't you come forward while we stand and sing?